Um, this uh, press conference is live streamed on our website, so you can find it also afterwards again. Um, so I will introduce our panel. Um, I have um, to my left Elene um, Gordon, who is President and Chief Executive Officer of Engridion Incorporated in the US. Um, I have next um, Francesco Starace, who is Chief Executive Officer and General Manager of Enel in Italy. Um, then Brian Galatha, Galica, um, President and Chief Executive Officer of United Way Worldwide in the US. And last but not least, our Latin American voice uh, here uh, is Carlos Salazar Lomelin, um, Chief Executive Officer of FEMSA Mexico. Um, so, ladies first. <laughs> FEMSA, yeah, in, in short. Uh, ladies first, of course, uh, so please, um, Ms. Gordon, um, if you could share your, your uh, expectations and, and eventual topics that you would like to put forward. Well, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here, and I'm honored to be a co-chair of this regional World Economic Forum Latin America meeting. And Ingridion uh, is very much a global company, but Latin America is very important to us, and I'll get to that in a moment. Ingridion is a $6 billion global company, and we are very focused on food ingredients. Now, we have no brands, but our ingredients come from nature, corn, potato, uh, yucca or tapioca, and rice, and we formulate those ingredients for healthy food products and beverages. And we convert these crops and, again, sell these ingredients to food and beverage companies. And so our company is located, actually we manufacture in 40 countries, but actually 35% of our sales, our revenues, are to Latin America, for Mexico and South America. But almost half our people, we have 11,000 people, but 5,000 are employed in Latin America, so it's a very important region to us. And we're very excited about the opportunities in Latin America because we see not only the GDP growing in the long term, but we see the rise of the middle class um, increasing in all the countries. And we see the demand for healthy ingredients by the consumers. And so we formulate these recipes and work with the food and beverage companies to make these ingredients uh, for food that is tastes good and is healthy, and we are a leader in texture. So it has a very good mouthfeel, and people want to eat food with our ingredients. Now, for us, Latin America, as I said, is a growing region. We've made many investments uh, for our company in Mexico, in Brazil, in Colombia, Argentina, uh, the whole region. And so, one of the reasons I wanted to be here was to meet with our customers, which I've already started to do, to talk about ways that we can formulate healthy food ingredients for the consumer over the long term. So I'm very interested in the meeting to meet not only with customers, but with government officials so that we can talk about stable policies that will help the GDP and the income of consumers so they are able to have uh, the opportunity to buy our affordable solutions as we work with the food and the beverage companies. So it's a very exciting time. Uh, we're a company that's been successful and we are committed to Latin America. Uh, we've, been in the, we've been in Latin America actually 90 years. Our company is over 100 years old. And again, we look to expand both with our research and development and with mergers and acquisitions and investments in our communities. So again, very happy to be here for the opportunity to interact with my many colleagues here today. Thank you very much. So I hand over to Francesco. Thank you. Um, and again, I'm also honored to be here as a co-chair for this important uh, <coughs> WEF uh, meeting, regional meeting. Um, I, we believe that WEF had a great idea to establish this pattern of regional meetings 
they uh, they should serve the purpose to really focus the uh, the local administrations, the uh, the politicians, the head of states to what global instances are there in the world and how can they be uh, important and why are they important for the region. And I think WEF is doing a great job at, uh, at that. And I think also the idea of doing this in Medellin um, has a big significance. It is not the capital of Colombia, but it is adding a total different dimension to the to the flavor of the SWEF meeting because it is the big industry uh, center of the of the country. It shows the importance of uh, business of uh, of the private sector into the WEF agenda, and I think it's extremely important that we underline that with our presence here. Uh, overall, I think. What we're trying to do here as, as Enel, Enel has a very, very large presence uh, in the utility space uh, across Latin America. We are in many, many countries. We are, in many of them, uh, the biggest utility uh, in terms of energy and distribution of energy. Um, and one is the, the case of Colombia is one of them. And, and we are heavily investing. Uh, more than 50% of our growth uh, investments are directed to Latin America since about now two years. And we see this trend continuing like that for the next three, four. Overall, that's why we think Latin America is, is, is key for us. And we think it is in, of tantamount importance that we stress the need for harmonized regulatory frameworks, harmonized legislation, and in general, the end of short-termism and some stable outlook for policies that would attract sizable infrastructure investments in the region. They are needed, they are badly needed, uh, they need to be carried out if we want the economy to really pick up. Uh, there's no economy growth without energy and there is no uh, cheap way of doing that if there is not a clear and, and, and long-term view on the investment side. So that's basically the message we try to, to uh, bring across. And we think we're encouraged, we see a lot of attention, a lot of uh, goodwill, uh, great news from countries that we wouldn't dream of, one of them Argentina, and also very good news from countries that started well, one of them Colombia, that continue to go in this path. So thanks again for being here, and of course we'll be happy to answer your questions when they will come. Thank you very much. Um, Brian Gallagher, please. Thank you. Um, I'm also very honored to uh, be a co-chair and proud to sit with uh, the other co-chairs. Uh, United Way Worldwide is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we generate uh, just over $5 billion per year U.S. Um, uh, our interest in, in the World Economic Forum is, and cross-sector gatherings like this, is uh, we sit in the intersection between corporations and their employees local NGOs, so not the big NGOs that you've heard of, but those that are local in communities, and government. And our mission is to um, fight for the, the health, education, and financial stability of every person in every community. So we're not special interest oriented, we're community oriented, um, and we believe that cross-sector is how you make uh, social change happen at scale. Um, we here in here in Latin America, uh, I should say, of the of the five billion dollars that we generate every year, we're in 41 countries, 100, 1,800 local uh, uh, operations of United Ways across that footprint, and 95 percent of all the money that we generate is private. So we like to partner with government. We're not fond of taking their money. Um, we think that. Um, private sector, corporations, employees, individual contributors allow us flexibility and innovation to partner. Uh, we have 11 affiliates here in Latin America. Uh, some are known as United Way here in Colombia. It's uh, Diviendo por Colombia. Uh, Fondo Unido in Mexico is the largest non-government foundation in Mexico growing very quickly. Um, our focus and, and my focus in my involvement with the forum for many years now has been, and I'll, I'll kind of build on Francisco's point that, um, so you need good investment for inclusive growth. You also need to focus on people. Yeah. That um, there's no ever in the history of the world been long-term sustained economic growth without human success. Um, and as we move into the fourth industrial revolution and age, 
I don't think that's ever been more apparent. Uh, move from industrialization to computer age, and now it's infometrics. And everything is horizontal. Individuals don't need to necessarily interact and go to work for big companies or come through United Way to do what they want to do. Sometimes they don't even need a representative in government. Um, it's who has access to information and who can create value in that. So I think corporations, civil society organizations, and governments need to not just say we need inclusive strategy and policy, but actually have a strategy for people. Um, and so how uh, education, so I'll finish with this. Uh, I'll be, I'm, not a, I'm not an economic expert, but uh, a big part of the success of Latin America over the last decade or so, among other things, was commodity prices and uh, a very hot Chinese economy and Indian economy and others. And as commodity prices came down, uh, the risk is how do you maintain the middle class and the folks who have come out of poverty? And in our view, it's a, an investment in people. Uh, it's education, it's tr early childhood education, it's primary education, um, because the next, the next um, stage of the global economy will be those who have access to information and can turn that information into value, and that's going to be driven through education, and that will take good government, really visionary business leadership, and I think civil society organizations that are prepared to work with each. Thank you very much. Uh, Carlos, Salasa, Tamilin. No, Melin, sorry. Yeah. Please, yes. Uh, you can speak in Spanish if you prefer, of course. If uh, everybody prefers that I speak in Spanish, I can switch in, in Spanish because I believe everybody understands better the Spanish than, than English. Um, it's truly a pleasure to be here in Colombia, in Medellin, and be the only voice on this panel representing Latin America. You know that FEMSA is a company that, even though it is international, it is eminently Latin American. We have 264,000 employees all over the continent, and in Colombia, we have 14,000 workers who are FEMSA employees who work day in, day out to become a better organization. I am convinced that this forum comes at a very important time. I am convinced that what we are discussing here today and at the heart of all our concern lies whether what we once thought was a non-stoppable trend, which is globalization, will actually be the future of our communities, or will the protectionism we are witnessing in many parts of the world, in many regions, and among very important leaders from equally important countries, will be what will triumph in the end in this controversy on whether globalization or protectionism will win in the future. It's actually quite concerning to see what's happening in England with their leaving the European community where I saw this week the stats, uh, the survey statistics, uh, and the yes in favor of uh, leaving the European economic community is five points uh, higher than staying in it. Uh, countries that uh, were once the uh, promoters of globalization. We all know that after the tragic events in Orlando, Florida, a couple of days ago, we can actually observe two trends with a complete and absolute divergence, one promoting barriers, promoting walls, promoting migrant control and uh, controlling regulating investment, and another which bets on what we, many of us here, believe. At this specific juncture, Latin America, on top of this, is facing very, very peculiar problems. Foreign investment is dropping in our region. It's falling. The most recent numbers I have, which are numbers for 2014, it dropped by over 2014, 2015. It is approaching a 20% reduction. We see 
see some clear exemptions or exceptions, which is Mexico that has seen an increase in foreign investment, but the region as a whole has seen a reduction. And world trade is not growing more than 3.1% in recent years. And China and India taken out of this percentage, world growth stands below 1%. So, so at this time when we are discussing whether the, glo the world will go for more or less globalization at a time when our region is losing foreign investment and trade is becoming increasingly complicated, well, Latin America has what has been traditionally its problem, lack of economic growth, lack of investment absence of investment in education, lack of investment in new technological trends, in digitalization, preparing our youths for a world that is increasingly connected, lack of money in our public finances, where we see significant deficits in our finances, current account deficits. So among all these problems is where we entrepreneurs find ourselves, and we are convening or want wanting to summon, and I think that this is a wonderful opportunity to reiterate that the respect for lawfulness, that stable policies, that greater interaction between businesses and entrepreneurs, that we have the opportunity to enter into better trade partnerships will translate into what we feel can be achieved through globalization, through the exchange of investment flows, where we can help build better societies and bring well-being, which is what we care the most about, not just for Latin Americans, but for all the people in the world. FEMSA continues to invest. We've announced investments in the amount of $1 billion in different countries in our different businesses. We continue creating jobs. Last year, we created 30,000 new jobs. And this year, I hope that the number will range between 20 and 30 uh, thousand more during the course of the year. So we believe in this. But yes, of course, we are wor worried about what may happen worldwide. Thank you very much. Espero que me hayan entendido mejor que en mi inglés. I hope you understood me better in Spanish than in my broken English. So now that uh, the co-chairs have shared with you their vision and 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 expectations, also um, we have now time for questions. Um, I would like to ask if you have a question to please um, keep it within the, the the theme or related to the meeting. Uh, if you have unrelated questions, you can ask them after the press conference. Um, and if you ask a question, please introduce yourself before you ask the question. So do we have any questions on the floor here? <coughs> please. Hello, my name is Andrea Vera. I'm from Medellin, from a local newspaper here in Medellin. And I would like to ask an open question because this local web is also related somehow to the Davos meeting at January and the fourth industrial revolution. And there's a concern underneath the fourth industrial revolution and is if lowest skilled labor will be replaced by labor. But this is a paradox because companies wants to be as efficient as this can be. So how do you see this paradox in the future and how related is this with the inclusive growth of Latin America, which is the center of this meeting? Thank you. Yeah, very good question. Uh, do you want to address it to somebody in particular, or otherwise we, we will take it? Well, yes, because there are all Yes. Okay. okay. Well, Lady, I'm, I'm happy first. to start. Yes. Thank you yes. so much. Yes. Well, I think there's many opportunities for different skills of labor. And yes, it may seem like a paradox, but in a global company, um, there is a value chain where different types of skills are required. So as an example, in my business, uh, we uh, purchase natural raw materials from farmers. And while we um, don't own the farms, we look at it as our responsibility to help farmers be more efficient. So we set up many operations, as an example, in Colombia uh, with yucca, farmers and help them be efficient. We've helped uh, entrepreneurs start up bakery businesses because we supply ingredients for bakers, so it's a very entrepreneurial. Even in Brazil, we've helped 
um, corn farmers be more efficient for sustainable crops. So I see that skill uh, involvement still being there, even with the fourth industrial revolution. Now, if you look at the whole value chain, and we make many investments in capital equipment, it's true we make investments uh, that will require higher skill levels. But as part of our company, we feel it's very important to train our employees around the world to be capable to not only uh, manage the new equipment um, and be productive, but to also manage their careers and to be have satisfying lives. And so we actually make it the responsibility of the employee to talk with their supervisor every point in time, formally, informally, to how to have a very productive career. And if there are skills that they would like to learn, we look at it as our responsibility to help them learn those skills. Thank you. I think, Brian, you, you wanted to react. Since well, you what, what I would say is if, if we focus specifically on the fourth industrial revolution that you talked about, it, this is going to be about access to information. So according to the World Bank, there are 4 billion Google searches every day in the world. And there are 4 billion people in the world who don't have access to the internet. Uber has created an unbelievably valuable, however you can debate what value is, valuable by um, company, and they don't own a single automobile. It's who has access to the information going forward. And I think that's true for companies as well, to train lower skill employees access to information because that's the way decisions are going to be made uh, more in the future. That's the way value is going to be created. And so our, our job training systems, our school systems, our employment patterns are going to have to change. Our, our forms of government uh, are going to have to change to give access to everybody to the information that is increasingly coming online. Because that's the way I think value is going to be created. So, and this is not a... Um, this is not a, a reference to the, the coming Olympics, but um, we need to be making those kind of investments in education and access to technology, especially digital technology, for all people because they will create value that we haven't even thought of yet if they have the resource, and the resource today is information. Thank you. Francesca, you uh, wanted to maybe react also? I, I should say that <clears throat> yes, there is a fourth industrial revolution happening in many parts of the world, but today we have about 1.3 billion people with limited or no access to electricity around the world. For these people, we are not even at the first industrial revolution. So our task, because we are working in all parts of the world, is while we are transforming and digitizing and changing uh, the way in which we work at home, and our employees are changing their professional content and behavior to adapt to what is going on. And I think it's the demonstration of the fact that this is possible is that we have basically a huge change in the legacy infrastructure that we own, but no real change in the number of employees, just a redirection of them in different uh, areas. And I think the, the feedback we have is that actually many people think it was overdue. Mm. I mean, it was not a surprise for anyone. Right? Most of us are more digitized at home than at work. That's experience. So that's not a big deal so far, at least in our company. But we have, on the other, why, on the other side, a way of making this 1.3 billion people aware that there is electricity and that that can change their way of working and living. It will improve, probably, the quality of their life and will also guarantee some future to their children because the world will... Uh, will discriminate people that will have little education or will not be able to use what today the fourth industrial revolution children are using. So that's a task we have and it's a task that we're pushing in a big way um, through the global compact uh, effort in the United Nations and we have a lot of efforts in particular in Latin America to push entrepreneurship on one end at local level, form people to really do their own job, okay? And on the other side, try and find cheaper, robust, and easy way to generate electricity locally so that this can become a basic commodity and not just a privilege. That's main, the main thing we're trying to do. Thank you. I, I thought that my colleagues answered very well the, <laughs> the, your question and maybe to allow our, our people here to make another question 
maybe it's better to I, I very hear. quickly uh, mentioned that uh, our chairman, uh, Professor Schwab, who unfortunately could not come here, he actually is publishing this week here in Spain um, the Spanish version of his book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution. So you'll find it in Spanish now. Um, and obviously, uh, that's that's the main topic also, um, this, this challenge. Okay, um, do we have other questions here on the floor? Yes, please. Mi Spanish. Eh, mi nombre es Douglas Balvin. Eh, My name is Douglas Balvin. Uh, in a scenario where everyone is scared because there will be a setback in the globalization process, what uh, perspective do you see on the issue of poverty in Latin America? Because uh, new developments show that the great threat is that there is a setback in the struggle against poverty. Can I answer this question? And I'm going to answer it in Spanish. I believe that you have mentioned the most important point about the issues that we are experiencing. When we look at the figures of the past 10 years, our region, Latin America, had improved in the struggle against poverty. We had had a reemergence of a middle class, and I would say that even our institutions had been strengthened, and there had been a bet for democracy. Today, the trends are confusing. Markets are tremendously volatile, and our region is suffering consequences which, although they were very favorable in the past years, today winds are blowing against. The commodities prices are dropping, the world market has been reduced, and the flow of foreign investment has also looked for better places to invest. So this is an entire challenge for Latin America, and I think that we Latin America must be aware of this. But in this, uh, uh, this is where most opportunities exist. Uh, so the summon, uh, the calling to the investors is that at a time of confusion, yes, we do have confusion and there's more risk, but there's also a better benefit if we take that risk. In FEMSA, that is how we think. And last week, we announced a new business in Chile. Last uh, month, we announced a new business in Brazil, countries where investors do not want to invest today or they consider the risk is too high. Last Friday, we announced another business with Prado in Mexico. And I think that everybody heard that we bought Unilever which is a soybean-based uh, uh, brand that is sold in all of the countries in Latin America. I am personally convinced that opportunities lie here. And the market is there, the consumers are there, they're all around us, and in the end, needs have to be met. Our colleagues were talking, were explaining very clearly that this problem of the jobs uh, coexists uh, with enormous unmet needs, uh, like, for example, people who don't have electricity nowadays. So these are tremendous opportunities for investors because we always have to look in the long term against the short term. We entrepreneurs are not speculators. We are not here for the, for the business of the week. We are entrepreneurs who invest in the long term and in the end we by and by doing so we become part of the communities and part of the fate of these communities. I'd like to say in, in closing that um, every time I visit a region I feel part of the region today. For example I feel Colombian and I feel Colombian because at the time when we begin to generate these 14,000 jobs that we generated here, oh there's a fly here that is driving me crazy. I'm even giving a job to the to the fly. And so uh, we are fully committed to the fate of Colombia, committed to what ha whatever happens to this region, and, uh, and we're committed to their being, prosperity, and well-being wherever we work. To my colleague, that uh, I think that government policies are very important in this area of poverty, and that's why I mentioned it in my opening remarks. Not only stability of policies, 
but attractive tax rates. So as an example, in Colombia, I know that there are discussions on changes in taxes. Well, as a, as a company investing, and I have choices every day to invest in 40 or 50 countries, so that if there was an opportunity, I would like to invest even more in Colombia. We have several factories here in Colombia, very successful, wonderful people uh, who love to work with employees and society and deliver affordable, healthy food solutions. So if tax rates are attractive, then this country, as an example, Colombia, will be able to attract more investment. And what happens, um, as my colleague from FEMSA talked about, when we have the investment, it creates jobs. We train people to perform the operations. And then for our company, it will give us the opportunity to design recipes that are very healthy that we produce on the equipment for the food and the beverage companies. So it all goes back to government policies being encouraging for investment. Thank you very much. I think we're running out of time. Unless um, you want to react on this, um, we're going to close uh, this uh, opening press conference with our co-chairs. Thank you again very much for being here. I wish you a great meeting uh, today and tomorrow. And we're going to hear from you actually at the closing, uh, at the end of the meeting. Thank you very much.